Welcome to my video, you guys. My name is Noah. I am here with author, counselor, and mental health superstar, Douglas Block. You've seen him on the channel. Please check out links in the description to find his stuff, books, websites, YouTube channel. He's a wonderful, wonderful resource for me, certainly can be for you. And our intention today was just to get together, pick each other's brains, and mostly I wanted to help get as much as I could out of him to help you guys with the topic of mental health relapse prevention and what to do when you might have already slipped into some sort of mood disorder uh, in order to sustain, survive, and then get out. If you're not doing well, hang in there, be brave, find support. If you're doing well, glad you're here, be thankful and see who you might be able to support. And I hope you guys enjoy the video. Noah and I first connected, he was in the psych ward. Yeah. Someone gave him a copy when, hoing, when going through Hell Don't Stop and he said, until I read this book, I thought I was the only person in the world who went through this experience. And he came to join my support group. Yeah, fast, forward, fact. Uh, fast forward four years later, now I'm in the psych ward. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes to St. Vincent Hospital, this little camera and does a little you know, quick documentary. Mm -hmm. This guy's in bad shape, and all of the people on your channel who you know gave me love and support, it was it was fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I don't know what the uh, one one good turn deserves another, right? Yeah. So, okay. 100%. So we, we we both supported each other when we were in the hospital. Well, that was uh, seven years ago, and so far, knock on plastic, uh, yeah, hospital free. Said like a true master. Amen, brother. Okay, so lead us, lead us on this journey. Oh, well, well, you know, the whole thing about relapse prevention came to me uh, quite personally. Uh, it was uh, 1983. God, time flies. Uh, almost 40 years. The year I moved to. Can Portland. you believe he's almost 45 years old? It exactly. blows my mind every yeah. time I see. How about yeah. 73? I started being depressed when I was 18, actually long before that, but I had a really bad episode when I was 32 after my girlfriend left. I lived with my parents for a year in New York and I finally made it back to Portland mm. and immediately everything opened up. I started my writing career, I, I met Joe, my current wife, partner, I found a, a job I could probably hold on to and, and we bought a house and within nine months everything had turned around, which mm. is why I tell people who are desperate and thinking of harming themselves. Hang in there because you never know what tomorrow may bring. So this got better and better. And after a while, I said, hey, I'm over. I'm, I'm 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. I'm done with depression. Mm -hmm. Finally, I've conquered this beast. Mm -hmm. You know, I've overcome this. And then in 1993, uh, Joe and I separated due to some personal problems. Uh, suddenly, my, my publisher, Bandit Books, uh, dropped three of my books. And I took this medication, this new medication, uh, named Effexor that completely flipped me out and put me into akathisia. And before I knew it, I was in hell again, my worst episode. And so I learned from that that uh, you can never say when it comes to depression or alcoholism, which uh, Noah has dealt with, that I'm done, I'm healed, I'm cured forever. Because uh, relapse can always be around the corner, you know, it can always be ready to sneak up on you. So what do you do? You have to basically be vigilant and take the same tools and strategies you use when you're depressed and when you were depressed, like reach out for support, take medication, maybe exercise, structure, routine, purpose, and keep doing it. Don't say I'm cured. Like you know, you take an antibiotic. Okay, ten days are up, the infection's gone. Who cares? Depression doesn't work like that. The brain is as always vulnerable to another episode if you've had one or two or three. So you can never rest on your laurels. And but the good news is, if you do these things. Uh, you know, you'll continue to live a good life. So you're, you're essentially saying, and I've had a similar experience in different ways, um, that an ounce of prevention can be worth a pound of cure. Yeah? To coin a new phrase. Yeah, but the other thing I want to talk about is sometimes you can head a relapse off at the pass. So when you, it's like starting to... Yeah, you can notice small signs. Like for me, the canary in the coal line is, is my sleep starts to get disrupted, which happened in December, and I almost lost it and had to go back in the hospital. Finally, fortunately, my nurse practitioner gave me this amazing uh, medication for me, Seroquel. It nipped it in the bud. The yeah. other thing you can notice, you're, you're, you're essentially uh, withdrawing more or you're losing interest in things that you used to enjoy. For myself and for a lot of people I know, when any part of four dimensions of wellness, which I'll quickly outline, start to waver, especially if more than two of them uh, begin to falter, I'm usually, and or people I've met are usually on that path to 
something negative, something destructive, uh, disruptive, excuse me, something bad. So you have bio, psycho, social, and spiritual health. Oh, yeah. Those are four dimensions yeah, of wellness that get little, brought like up. My little chart. 100%. Uh, <clears throat> biology, meaning like am I taking care of my body? That could be sleep. That could be physical hygiene. That could be exercise, food. Psycho, am I communicating with other people? Uh, am I current with my thoughts and my wants? Am I being honest with other people as to what's going on? Am I processing my feelings, a.k.a. not escaping them? Spiritual could be meditation. It could be formal religion. Um, it could be exercise. It could be getting in nature. That can be whatever you want. Biocycle, social. And am I spending time with people? Am I actually not isolating on a consistent basis? For me, if those four things are going pretty consistently, I'm usually okay. I'm not necessarily right, elated, right. but I'm usually okay. Yeah. If one of those goes away, I can get away with it. If two of those go away, right. I start to suffer. Right. So if you start noticing what Noah's noticing a eye, eye, for instance, with the, with the sleep issue or just kind of feeling more melancholic, mm -hmm. that's why I rate my moods every day from one to 10. Things you still you do. do that daily? Oh, I will never stop doing it. Wow. I was so traumatized in 96, 97. Yeah. So you say, okay, let, let's, you know, if, you, if you're starting to get a, like a sore throat, you go to the doctor. You don't wait for it to get to bronchitis and then to pneumonia, right? That's a good, that's a good so, point. So you say, okay, what can I do to head this off of the past? Oh, well, here's my skills. If I'm isolating, maybe I should start calling people. You know, if I'm feeling melancholy, let's get let's get an extra session with a the therapist. Mm -hmm. Or let's talk to my nurse practitioner bumping on my medication, right? If my sleep is really starting to go down the tubes, okay, you know, uh, you know, am I getting to bed the same night every night? Am I practicing good sleep hygiene, right? And, and so you notice the small, sometimes very subtle changes that are leading you down the path of relapse and you try to, you know, make corrections, course corrections, like oh, autopilot. Absolutely. While I, you can. And if I, exactly, and while you can, what I might interject that's worked really well for me is if I'm not sure if this is happening the way I think it is, if I'm in any way, shape, or form struggling to be objective with my own behavior, you ask, else. You ask someone who knows you well enough, who has your best intention, at heart, who can give you some yeah. honest feedback, who can yeah. help you do something that a lot of us struggle with, which is reality yeah. test. Am I, um, am I seeming like myself? Are you right. noticing anything that's troubling right. or alarming? Espe There's nothing wrong with getting that feedback. Especially in mania. I had to finally, uh, at the age of 65, had to admit that I'm bipolar too, uh, which means instead of going to these floridly manic things where you spend all your money you don't have and, you know, and, and think you're going to be president of the United States. Hey, uh, Doug, you will be. Just don't give up. All right, thank you. Anyway, um, I wouldn't want that job. Uh, but uh, you start to kind of, <clears throat> you know, get a little bit um, grandiose. You start to sleep less. Mm -hmm. Joan w was always good at m noticing, because mm -hmm. you don't notice yourself when you're becoming manic, if you, sure. have, if you have bipolar disorder. Someone else has to point it out towards you. You, you don't have objectivity. Mm -hmm. So when I go to see my nurse practitioner uh, virtually, Joan always shows up and he says, okay, have you noticed that Douglas is more irritable? Have you noticed that his, you know, his, his mood has is, is, is changed? Because as Noah says, you need someone looking at you objectively because you can't always tell yourself if you're going down the tubes. Yeah, staying current that, with that, yourself that, can yeah, be hard. So that's so that it's important to have someone around you who can witness you and can give you a heads up. 100%. The other thing is, okay, so let's assume that you don't head it off the pass and you start your back in that same pit. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of alcohol stuff that Noah deals with, some people will say, Oh my God, I had a drink. Oh my God, I, my recovery is destroyed. Hey, might as well get drunk anyway and just forget about the whole thing. Yeah, that, which also uh, leads into self-deprecating right, language right. and behavior. Uh, and so what I like to call it on the male health side and alcohol side is this is not a relapse, it's a dip. Hmm. And you can respond really quickly, course correction, like the autopilots that take you from New York to LA, you don't even know it, but they're not always pointed towards LA. They deviate here, deviate there, and the course correction of the computer keeps putting them right back on target. So think of a course correction if you have a dip or something starts to go down the tubes as opposed to throwing up your hands and saying, you know, it's all over. Uh, uh, and the other thing to remember is you came out of it before, you'll come out of it again. 100%. And, it's to stay reasonable right, with yourself right, and right. it's not to discredit the progress you've made it's right. not to to speak for the future and and become hopeless right. and anxious about the probability of xyz this is now that was then do your right. best to soothe yourself be nice to yourself be unconditionally supportive of yourself and remember that you're you're not a failure. I mean, I have to, I refuse to ever go down a path where I'm gonna validate this idea, which has been a long-standing misnomer in my mind. It comes from a lot of different things I've learned about with childhood trauma and, oh, and yeah. who knows what, but I'm constantly looking for validation that there's something bad or wrong about me. So when something happens, um, historically, that 
is out of line with who I think I am or what I think I want, it was very easy for me to say fuck it. Very, very easy. Throw caution to the wind with whatever. If it was with a diet, then I would go back to binge eating and gaining weight. If it was, if it was exercise, let's say I miss a couple days, well screw it, I might not go. If it's with drinking, well I had a drink or I got drunk one night, everything's ruined, this confirms it. I'm gonna go ahead and obliterate my life. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's black and white thinking. It's black and white it, thinking. One, one of the 10 cognitive distortions, black and white thinking, mm -hmm. all or nothing. All or nothing. Yeah, that doesn't getting, work that way. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. And getting away from that reality and accepting it doesn't have to be that way is very soothing, it's very right. calming. Because what happens when you start being negative towards yourself? It, well, then, then you, you, you stop treating yourself well, and that's, right. the whole, and that's the whole way to stay mentally and physically healthy. 100%. It's all about self-care, boys and girls. It really is all about self-care. And, and, and I would then, say it's also about ritualized, habitual self-care. Oh yeah, yeah, about getting into a, a routine yeah. and, and having consistency. Because you won't always be in the mood. Right. Well, well, you, literally. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to make yourself go to the gym even if you don't want to. You have to make yourself, you know, go ahead and call that, make, they call maybe the 30,000 or the 3,000 pound phone or something. Mm. Yeah, you, you have to do things uh, that when you may not be feeling like it. So, you know, it's a tough job, uh, a tough you know, job. staying physically mental healthy, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, this is why I'm such a big believer in, in groups, such a huge believer. If you go to a group, whether it's the support groups I used to run or AA or all the other 12 set groups, you have other people around to give you the encouragement when you falter, to realize you're not alone, mm -hmm. to realize that you're not the only one, to realize you're not defective. Group support to me is one of the most powerful, if not the powerful thing, most thing you can do to create consistent uh, mental and physical health. Yeah. Uh, we are, we were, Evolved in community, we evolved in tribes. Human beings are pack animals, we're social animals, that's mm -hmm. why we get along with dogs. And when we get together in a group, it does something to the brain chemistry. It really does. We're talking about a million years of evolution mm -hmm. here. So this is why uh, people live in communities and this is why the community support of 12-step groups, support groups of all kinds are so powerful for you know keeping people on the path. So I said in my last video, there's never been a better time to be mentally ill than now. Yeah, there's a lot of resources. Yeah, there's resources. It, I mean, look look at ketamine, you know, uh, for depression. Mm -hmm. now, now it's psilocybin here in Portland. We have ECT. We have TMS. We've got a bunch of medications. I used to be a skeptic until I took Seroquel, and it felt like somebody was stitching my brain back together. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and, and listen, something I want to interject that popped in my head. We're talking about things that we know work. We know right. work. It, it's, it's just a matter of fact. It doesn't mean you think it's going to work in the heat of mental health right, relapse. Right, right. Like if you're already there, it's not a requirement to believe, or agree with, or think that it'll work for you. You just have to physically get yourself to do it. Yet no one ever, for example, and I think most people can relate to this, let's say you're on a spectrum of not doing well. You're not at the bottom, but you're not at the top. No one's ever gone into a good workout, left that workout, be it a bike ride, a run, oh, yeah, a weightlifting, ride. CrossFit, left it and thought, I wish I hadn't gone. I feel worse. It just doesn't happen. The same thing happens with community support. Uh, it's one of those things that you need to go in spite of yourself because others can hold the belief for you, like right, we right. could, that it will make a difference. Right. And we're we're talking about survival, and that's how I kind of see it. Maybe you think that's dramatic. No, no. Depending it, on how it, bad it, you are, it, it's all, we need it's we all, want it's, to survive. It's all about survival. It's all about survival. Yeah. So um, we're not saying necessarily that doing this is going to make you not be in pain, but it might lead to less pain, negative happiness, as well, you taught me about. Right. I mean, the whole my whole theme and my 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 uh, website, overcoming suicidal pain, which I wish I had stuck with the original title, survival, surviving suicidal pain, because you're not saying that you're just going to survive. But the point is, is that. People become suicidal when the level of pain they're in overwhelms their ability to cope with the pain. Correct. So you can do two things. You can either increase your coping resources or decrease the pain. Yeah. Exercise is, is I think, like you said, you cannot exercise and not have your brain change for the better. And exercise and, can be small and easy. Yeah, right, right. So every time you decrease the pain, even two or three percent, it means uh, your 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 level of hope goes up, and your and your chances of recovery go up. So, 100%. Yeah. So there are things that if you do them, you know they're going to work to some extent. And the thing is that you have to. It's tough when depression robs you of motivation, and, but and this is why you need other people around you. Right? right. You need you need your best friend to come over and say, "Okay, Doug, I know you don't feel like it, but we're going to go for a run around the block or go on a bike mm -hmm. ride." And then and then once you start doing it, it's exercise. Oh wow, yeah, now I remember why I did this. So, um. You know what else can rob me of motivation? And I know you're the same, I know you're the same. Doing really well 
can sometimes rob you of the motivation to do the little things that helped you get out of or maintain mental health, and it's its own little trap. Uh, mood's going good, friendships are going good, finance is going good, life is going well. You're content, you're mostly upbeat, you're relatively removed from legitimate and despairing anxiety and depression. I think part of this video and my hope for this video as a reminder to myself and certainly for anyone that happens to be in a better space, particularly if you're someone who's in a better space coming from a dangerously unwell space, don't rest on your laurels. Find ways to stay consistent, right. whatever that means for you, to continue to work on the dimensions of wellness we've talked about and just to not be afraid, not live in fear of the return, but just to show respect for where you came from. I know this is something I've struggled with. I've done better and gotten way less healthy until suddenly I wasn't doing well again. And then I panic and scramble and try to remember what I did to feel better as opposed to trying to maintain uh, to whatever degree some balance in those right. in those different ways. What do you think? What do you uh, think, old bud? There was a, uh, I wish I had word black. I look much better in black. Oh, oh well. Doug, you're as handsome as it gets, brother. Oh, thank you. Anyways, Ram Dass, this great spiritual teacher, used to say, comfort puts people to sleep. Comfort puts people yeah. to sleep. It, it, there's a danger in being too comfortable. Yeah. For the very reason you said, uh, then you just essentially, there's no motivation. I mean, no pain, no gain. I know it sounds like a cliche, it is a cliche, but, but it's, it's true. true. People do yeah. not change unless they become uncomfortable enough to make the change. That's me. So, so, <laughs> That's and it's human nature. Me. Human nature yeah. is if things are going well, why should I change anything? Yeah. So in some ways, crises are, are opportunities for growth and transformation. So when your life is falling apart, it may not be a bad thing. Yeah, 100%. Maybe, it may be that a, an opportunity for you to try something different and reorient yourself in a way that you'll come out better. I'm, I'm a bi big believer in the, uh, the idea that all things are happening for the best for us, even the things that uh, were, were pain, tragedy, loss occur. I mean, you can't know at the time, but when no. you look back, like, you know, the fact that this woman, Eugene, who I love, left me, well, went into the psych ward for, you know, living with my parents for a year, but what happened? The phoenix rose from the ashes. I ended up here in, in Eugene and in Portland in this house I've lived in since 1983. Met Jones, so you know the, the loss and and the uh, disruption, you know that I felt with this relationship in my life falling apart, ended up getting me in a much better place than I would have if that hadn't happened. Yeah, so, and I think so, paying attention to yeah. the the beginning stages of any given issue, right. be it addiction or mental health, is important because I think you, you can learn from others. It doesn't have to go to the absolute bottom before you start flipping it and leveraging it for for positive change. It does require lifelong vigilance, but again, what's the payoff? Healthy lifestyle, social, spiritual, you know, mental, physical, and you know, the things you can control. They say, "Hey, you should work on." Uh, obviously, sometimes something's going to happen. You get a diagnosis, your partner dies or leaves, then you respond to it. But in general, uh, you can basically have a lot to say about your mental health by you know doing these very simple lifestyle habits. And just being consistent. Yeah, being consistent, taking responsibility right. for yourself, being gentle with and, yourself. And also the phrase may, relapse is part of recovery. You know, the, It's not a requirement, no, but, but, it, but it does happen. There is no way that people go through life without having their losses or their tragedies. You can't avoid them. But however you can make use of them, Yeah, they can be what I call redemptive. You can take a lemon aid. No, you can take a lemon and make it into a lemonade. You don't want to make a lemonade into a lemon. That would be tough. That would be very difficult. That'd be going against entropy. But anyway, yeah, no, I, I believe that anything can be used uh, as grist for the mill for your spiritual growth. Good. I would have been done a long time ago if I didn't believe that. I think I've I would been, too. I have been in ridiculously dark places. If I didn't have my spiritual belief to hold on to, it would be all over. So, you know, what can I tell you? Keep on trucking, as the Dalai Lama said, never give up, never, never give up. Be. And if you fall, just get right back up. Uh, what was that? Seven times fall, eight times get up, or something like that. I mean, everyone gets a 10 steps forward, 9.9 .9 steps back, take another 10 right, steps. Right. I mean, and find people you identify with. I, I think that'd be a really nice way to end this video from my perspective. As he mentioned earlier, when I had my big mental breakdown, my suicidal depression that was brought on as far as how it was catapulted by an adverse reaction to a medication, but yes, I was yes, actually yes. already beginning to be depressed and anxious in a possibly clinical way on a lower level. It flipped into something more aggressive. 
I had convinced myself that no one had ever gone through what I was going for. Excuse me. I had convinced myself no one had ever been through what I was going through. No one could have told me different because it was so uniquely uncomfortable until I read his memoir and found out um, that someone else in fact had, which led to a lot of hope. So thank you guys for being here in this video. Yeah, get this book. All links will be in the description. Doug, thank you for being on my channel and spending some yes, time. Yes, and, yes, And uh, yeah, comment below. Let us know what you'd love to see in the future. All those things. Just know that we're holding space for you. We appreciate you. And, um, and we'll see you guys in the next video. And I must say, Noah is looking terrific. Oh! He's an example. Everything he talks about, he's an example. At least today. Today. Now, now two years ago, he was a complete mess. That's right. But, but today is, is a new day. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Doug. Perfect. Uh, well, you can edit that any way you want, huh? Absolutely. Oh, we. I, I just wanted us to put out as much. As oh we yeah, could. yeah. I mean, it's all. I mean, I, it's. I mean, was that literally about twenty-five minutes? Yeah, it was twenty-five minutes. I am so fucking good at keeping time of things. I have a, I have an internal clock that is beyond me. Yeah, you do. Well, so anyway, I don't know. Should we leave it at twenty-five minutes.